on planned secondary metabolites of medicinal value jointly organized by School of Postgraduate Studies of Tamil Nadu Agriculture University and it is about the goal. We are elated to invite our compassionate mentor, Professor and Head, Department of Plant Molecular Biology and I welcome our distinguished speaker of this endowment lecture, Professor R. Saldamini from National Center for Biological Sciences which is a wing of Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. She is a renowned computational biologist, a humble and simple person. The huge volume of publications she has made and the honors she has received bear the testimony of the fact on the proven record of the structural networks associated with her intelligence. TNAU feels proud in welcoming you, Madam, for this prestigious Dean SPGS Endowment Lecture. Welcome, Madam. I request Director CPMB to honor the guest speaker with a shawl and bouquet. the university who is here to preside the endowment lecture and to inaugurate the workshop. Despite of his heavy commitments, he has agreed here to grace the occasion. <laughs> for Plant Molecular Biology and Biotechnology, who has landed recently from the award ceremony of NAS Fellows, he is the youngest NAS fellow among the six from TNAU. He is an inspiring teacher, a fast runner and executor of innovative ideas. He is well known for his quality publications. A warm welcome you to sir. I request Dr. Uma, Professor Head Biochemistry, to welcome Director Ikaboki. and our respectable Dean SPGS, the generous funder for this program. Though they could not be here due to their official commitments, I feel it is my duty to propose a welcome note at this junction. I welcome other university officers, particularly uh, controller of examination, heads of department, soil science, earlier former director, Dr. Morgan Kumar, a special welcome because only because of the MOU we have initiated, uh, this lecture was proposed and the other head of the departments, other colleagues from TNAU and particularly the students who had gathered here uh, with a thirst and quest for updating their knowledge. Once again, a warm welcome to each one of you. Thank you. Comment lecture, Professor R. Saudamani. Our Professor and Head, Bioinformatics, Dr. Nanam, and Professor and Head, Biochemistry, Dr. Uma, and Dr. Kohila Devi, Biochemistry, Professor and Head, Biotechnology, and the Previous director Dr. Mohan Kumar and uh, Dr. Balasubramaniam, the controller of examinations. So he actively engaging in the student activity in recent days. Uh, I kindly approved the program. We uh, have a team PGS, Dr. Kobal sir, and the uh, and, uh, team uh, for their support for this program. And also, and our head of the departments, uh, student friends. We have the uh, well known speaker, uh, Dr. Sir. I want to tell a few words about her. Uh, Dr. Ramanathan Srinivasan Saudamani was born in 1964 and studied in general chemistry in Stella Maris College in Chennai during 1981 to 84 and later in the Institute of Science in Chennai from 84 to 86 a master's degree. After that she moved to the Bangalore and for the PhD in the biophysics, the, the top Indian Institute, Indian Institute of Science from 86 to 90. 92 under the previous uh, director Dr. Balaraman. After six years of postdoctoral research <coughs> at uh, in London and also university of, mainly in the University of Cambridge and Tom Brutal Laboratory and she, after that she been offered the position in India where she moved to the National Center for Biological Sciences, the NCBS, uh, one of the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, TFIR in 1998. From that onwards, she is working in various capacities in this NCBS and she has continued to do their research in various computation biology. As Sodomani has interest in the protein structure and functional prediction and also his 
Herb Group has developed a database for aligned protein families, associated sequence from beta genome databases. And these are useful to bridge the gap between the large number of protein sequences which are highly accumulated in the MCPI every time and which he want to give some functional things for that. And also, she also in, uh, contributed for the analysis of protein-protein and protein-ligand interactions. So this group has recently computationally searched pre-approved drugs which are naturally available in small molecule to fight out against SARS-CoV-2. Her group also participated in collaborative projects designing mutations and predict function stress upregulated genes in mulberry. And also, she have developed the algorithm to recognize protein binding sites before uh, stress upregulated genes in plant genomes and is valuable for the uh, agriculture students and also agriculture scientists. So, with a very long history, a long biodata, I have just given a brief about uh, her major achievements. Uh, with the eminent speaker, we are going to have this uh, endowment lecture. And also, a few things uh, which uh, we, uh, since she's very long period, she's working on the uh, medicinal plants. And you know that a lot of uh, Indian literature, starting from Ayurveda and Siddha, we have 5,000 years of knowledge. And she taken a target plant, Tulasi, the Rama Tulasi, which she, she did the sequencing. And it is a very famous work in India, NCBS and also TFRI, which they celebrated for the Tulasi sequencing. And she found out a lot of compounds in that. So the, the, the researcher which they tried abroad and they tried to start their newer program and she started with their very strong background. So even though we have the traditional knowledge more than 5000 years uh, in terms of various Siddha and Ayurvedic medicines, only the just 200 years ago the morphine being found from OP, opium which became revolutionary the medical treatment in various pain killing and, and also it have the problem in the drug drug market also, that is a problem. Similarly, again it is a big revolution in the uh, medical field, in the pain killing and other things. Even though we have more than 20, 21,000 plants, only 2,500 plants only still exploited by the scientists or the people working in various uh, chemistry or the recent bioinformatics people are working, but a lot of potential is there. I think she is going to cover in his lecture on the since all are by, by so biotechnology and the horticulture students are major students here, agriculture students, which have which great potential. So the Indian people, a lot of agencies which predict that uh, your 230 billion dollar uh, medicinal plant market, I think that we have only uh, less than 1% share, only 500 million uh, we earn from foreign exchange. So this kind of lectures will motivate you to work on the, some of the medicinal plants which can able to get, fetch a novel market. Even though we exported a lot of raw material, we don't very few processed material which have been exported with solvent extracted and also sometimes the product like Himalayan drugs and also the Patanjali and SKM Sita in Tamil Nadu, Tamcol, they are marketing a lot of medicinal plants. So those plants which really have the, those are the companies really making some money on that and have max, maximum uh, foreign exchange revenue. So we have good medicinal plants department, madam. We have, and also we have good biochemists with us, and also we have a lot of uh, trained manpower in biotechnology and recently bioinformatics. We are building the manpower. So definitely, all these group together, which can able to uh, come up with some of the uh, novel compounds, novel product, which we are supporting through BIRAC program, EUA center, and agri business development. So your thought working lecture will give you an idea on the young minds. They can go for some kind of entrepreneurship skill on exploiting this kind of novel, novel venture. So with these few uh, things, uh, few words, I uh, welcome you for this uh, inaugural, this inaugural lecture, and also I request the registrar to give us special address. Thank you for the patient uh, Respected Respected Chief Minister Dr. Chaudhary from National Center for Biological Sciences, Bangalore, Dr. Sindhu, Director, CPMB, Dr. Arunyana, Pro Sindhu, Department of Plant Molecular Biology and Bioinformatics, Dr. D. Uma, Pro Sindhu, Department of Biochemistry, Dr. Balas Burmi, Controller of Examination, DMAU, Dr. Enro Gopal, uh, in charge Dean, SPGS, Dr. Mohan Kumar, former Director, 
senior faculty members and my dear student friends. Good morning to Dr. Sindhil for having me uh, obtain the very prestigious NAS Fellowship Award. Kindly give him a big applause. <laughs> and uh, I request all the youngsters here to have a, a request to the uh, youngsters. Uh, with this, uh, we will go to our business. I am indeed very happy to deliver special address on the occasion of the Dean SPGS Enrollment Lecture, jointly organized. Plant is an important source of medicinal and plays a key role in the world health. Medicine has a commanding role in the health system all over the world. This is a material for maintaining good health conditions. Many countries in the world, that is, two thirds of the world's population, depends on the herbal medicine for primary health care. From our records, most of the used drugs contain plant extracts. Some contain active ingredients obtained from plants. Among LCM civilizations, India has been known to be a rich repository of medicinal plants. About 8,000 herbal uh, remedies have been codified in Ayush systems in India. Recently, World Health Organization estimated about 80% of the people worldwide rely on herbal uh, medicines for some aspect of their primary health care needs. According to World Health Organization, around 21,000 plant species have the potential for being used as medicinal plants. As per the data available, over three quarters of the world population relies mainly on plants and plant extracts for health care needs. Treatment with medicinal plants is considered to be very safe as there is no or minimal side effects. These remedies are in sync with nature, which is the biggest advantage. The golden fact is that use of herbal, herbal treatment is independent of any age groups. Medicinal plants such as aloe, tulsi, neem, turmeric, and ginger cure several common ailments. Moreover, some plants are considered an important source of nutrition, and as a result of that, they are recommended for therapeutic values. Some of these plants include ginger, green tea, walnuts, aloe, pepper, and turmeric, etc. Some plants and their derivatives are considered as important source, of, source for active ingredients which are used in aspirin. Apart from the medicinal uses, herbs are also used in natural dye, pest control, food, perfume, tea, and so on. In many countries, different kinds of medicinal plants are used to keep ants, flies, and flee away from the homes and offices. Recipes for the treatment of common ailments such as hypertension, bronchial asthma, and fever are given by the traditional medicine practitioners very effectively. Biotechnological tools are important for multiplication and geno genomic enhancement of the medicinal plants by adopting technologies such as in vitro regeneration and genetic transformations. The production of secondary metabolites in plants and suspension cultures has been reported from various medicinal plants. In vitro regeneration holds tremendous potential for the production of high-quality plant-based medicine. Tissue culture protocols have been developed for several plants, but there are many other species which are overexploited in pharmaceutical industries. With the development of sequencing technology, the research on medicinal plants is no longer limited to the aspects of chemistry, pharmacology, and pharmacodynamics. The long run sequencing technology is established. The medicinal plant genomes with the large sizes have been sequenced and assembled more easily. Multiple omics methods are integrated to make better use of medicinal plant genome data and to solve practical problems meeting in the breeding and medical fields. In 2020, the number of published medicinal plant genomes has reached up to 53. In 2021, 33 plant genome, medicinal plant genome articles have been published until June 4th and the total article number is inferred to be more than 60. Thanks to the advancement of development of sequencing technology and bioinformatics algorithms, at least 100 medicinal plant genomes have been obtained. How to use them thoroughly and effectively has attracted the attention of many institutions and researchers. In recent years, several databases of medicinal plant genomes have already been built, such as the Herbal Medicine Omics Database, Medicinal Plant Genome Database, and Database of 10,000 medicinal plants. These databases summarize the medicinal plant genomes that have been reported at this stage are aimed to build the biological big data platform for medicinal plants. Linking the omics data, active ingredients, disease information, and other information to promote their modernization. 
All of the above indicate that the medicinal plant genome has entered the stage of big data association research from the stage of exploring the unknown. And uh, in this occasion, I am also very happy to inaugurate the virtual workshop jointly organized by NCDS, Bengaluru, and Department of Plant Molecular Biology and Bioinformatics, TNAU Payamutu, scheduled from today afternoon to 26, 2022. I wish the workshop, workshop the grand success and the useful one. Thanks for the opportunity given. Thank you, Anana. Thank you, sir. The measure of greatness in a scientific idea is the... I'm very honored and happy to be here in front of you. And uh, I would like to thank uh, each and every one of you for uh, making this place uh, like another home. Uh, I remember the last time we had uh, been here uh, was for a conference and it was just before the lockdown. And uh, thank God that uh, many of us uh, have been able to uh, survive and uh, I also feel that much has to be learned during this COVID period and it has uh, made us more aware of how much health is important and the nutrition as well. Yeah, I would like to thank uh, the Honorable Vice-Chancellor first of all for suggesting this idea of the endowment lecture although she could not be here today I know we had met last time and I also thank uh, the Registrar and the Head of the Departments uh, and also Professor Nyanam and Saranya in particular and also Dr. Uma for a very uh, nice way to post and I continue to keep coming uh, with the MOU I think no questions asked we will keep coming yeah, so, the testimony of this uh, success of the MOU remains to be seen in the following years. But hopefully, uh, this is taking off really well because I have some of my colleagues here uh, who is going to uh, help me to take um, a workshop in uh, jointly with TNAU as the register also pointed out. So, I will start off the talk by uh, giving you some introduction on um, how and why plants have been uh, taking so much attention for human health. Which are called secondary metabolites that have been observed in plants and have been exploited by human beings uh, for many, many years. And in fact, almost as, as long as the humans have been here, we have been exploiting this. So what are the sort of uh, proof that humans have been using uh, these uh, medicinal uh, value of the plants and let's take the very beginning 1st century BC or the 2nd century BC there have been texts in the form of uh, these sort of uh, you know leaves palm leaves by which uh, we have texts that are hidden into uh, beautiful uh, three big books which are called the Charaka, Samhita, Sar Sam Sanskrit, the Samhita and so on and the Charaka Samhita, for instance, does the, the name suggests that Charaka means someone who is travelling. So essentially, uh, this is knowledge that have been picked up by many travellers all around the world. It is not a single person called Charaka as we might think. Uh, in fact, it has been taken over from more people and uh, it has also been mentioned that the uh, origin of Charaka Samhita is not uh, exact and in fact the prior to Charaka Samhita we had something called Agnivesha Samhita and that has been uh, documented as something that started in the 1st or the 2nd century BC and at that time uh, the next following traditions uh, had to be kept and uh, some more people came in and multiple authors tried to revive and hold the text. And it is mentioned that only one third of the text could be found and others have been either lost or destroyed or simply we could not keep track of them. And therefore some of the authors have put in their own thoughts and tried to build them as what we see now as eight books going into 120 chapters. And what do they convey? They talk about how plants are important for human health and how it has to be incorporated in our diet, hygiene, in prevention and also in the medicinal uh, education, medical education. And they can make sure that the patient is able to recover in his or her health. And moreover, I would like to draw in the fact that it's not only in India, which we are uh, happy and proud of about these textbooks, 
but also in Greek, Hippocrates had documented textbooks on plant as medicine as early as the 4th century BC, Aristotle in the 4th century BC, and all the documents that are clearly available. And uh, there have been very, very early realization, as in Charaka Samhita, uh, what they say is the body is composed of molecules, and these are said to be uh, numberless and numerous and uh, this is nothing but referring to the atoms uh, for which uh, a scientific uh, description or even definition had not yet set in. But the fact that the body is made up of so many millions of small molecules uh, has already been realized in the 1st or 2nd century BC. So that is so humbling and also in the 8th century BC as, as of now also we can find some uh, kind of rock inscriptions in Indonesia and it, uh, wherein they talk about this sort of a huge tree and uh, there are lots of goddesses protecting their trees and why because this is called as a Kalpataru Kalpataru and how uh, people should protect it for their own welfare and so on so these are all the ways by which people have tried to pass on through generations Almost as long as the humans have been there, plants have been exploited by humans for their own health and benefits. And in fact, I also picked up another text um, because I am talking this in Tamil Nadu where I belong. Let me also read it out for you. Akti Pattai Churanam Saidu Nalanai Vittaraitu Pilavai Mudalana Varku Pattu Potal Gunamadu so this is a clear uh, kind of uh, commitment and, and, and there is a guarantee by which people say that if you apply a particular paste of the bark of a tree, you can uh, get a cure from ailments such as skin diseases or even something which may be more as much as uh, ulcers and so on. So with this thought and a brief introduction to the importance of trees and how they are intimately connected with human health, let me also introduce to you the topic uh, which is on the plant metabolites. Uh, plants uh, have to produce a lot of chemicals. Uh, not only humans do, uh, every living being have to produce chemicals for them to live and to be able to survive. And especially plants have to produce a lot more chemicals for them to survive because they cannot move away from danger. They cannot move away from uh, predators who might come and chew them and they can also run away from uh, biotic or abiotic stresses, a huge harsh sunlight may be there and uh, problems in the soil may be there so they just have to deal with them then and there and make sure that they also survive in the process. right? So uh, plants have produced what are called as produce what are called as secondary metabolites. As the name suggests, these are not required for the primary uh, life, but they are there for as a defense purposes, and they might be producing this to make sure that the pests won't attack them, the fungi won't grow on them, the microbes won't take over them, or even the pests. Uh, will not uh, chew them up too much, right? So, and uh, you can, as I say, if you go into the literature and start looking for the metabolites, as a very beautiful introduction that was given by uh, the director of the PBMB today, uh, you can see that several uh, small molecules are endemic to different plants, specific for that plant, or at least isolated and purified or even recognized in that plant for the first time. So, for instance, Arabidopsis thaliana, uh, you see that it is a plant metabolite called thalianol. And then in lotus, you have uh, a plant secondary metabolite called lotostarin. And in uh, tomato, you have something called alpha tomatine. And then uh, you have uh, more and more compounds like this in different plants. And the, end, uh, and the list is simply endless. And therefore, uh, like somebody said, even to choose what plants to study, uh, what sort of trees to uh, look in in depth, uh, it is a very hard decision because almost every plant has a, a very beautiful story of many different secondary metabolites that they are producing all the time uh, and as I said it could be for defense purposes. But also those who are uh, introduced to a bit of chemistry, 
we know that these, chemi uh, these chemicals uh, are not simple. They are not at all simple. You can see that there are some thick bonds and then some dashes here and there. This suggests that uh, some part of the uh, chemical bond is in front of us if it is thick and if it is behind us it is shown as dashed. So with respect to the plane of the whole molecule, you can see sometimes chemical groups come in front and sometimes at the back. And uh, if each of the chemical groups around an atom is different, then it's supposed to be a chiral molecule. Chirality is, uh, has to be appreciated not only because of the optics, but also because simply how uh, complex the, uh, that particular chemical is. The secondary metabolite is so complex that you can imagine even if we had appreciated, for instance, the thalianol in Ayurvedopsis thaliana is important for a particular ailment, for a cure. Uh, imagine if pharmaceutical industries have to synthesize that particular uh, molecule with the correct chemical groups in front and back. It's going to be extremely challenging because you cannot produce these molecules in that sort of specificity and precision with the right chirality of different groups uh, and plants do them very well. And plants do them naturally and therefore they are very, very smart. So this is what uh, interested our group uh, to participate and uh, adopt plants as our uh, genomes uh, or as our organisms for genome analysis. And we chose uh, medicinal plants because we know that all these secondary metabolites are synthesized within the plant by means of enzymes. And the enzymes ensure that they provide the right sort of chemistry and the environment so that the right molecule is produced and the wrong molecules are simply not encouraged. So the path is set by means of the beautiful specificity that's introduced by the plant enzymes. And this is what really interested us to go after the plant, uh, the medicinal plants uh, and their genomics or transcriptomics. Okay, so with this sort of an introduction, on the metabolites. I would also like to tell you, uh, our uh, we started shortlisting and from more than 300 medicinal plants that we believe are endemic to India, we shortlisted 25 of them and definitely Tulasi was on top. Why? Because it is the queen of herbs. And fortunately for us, our collaborator and my long-term friend and colleague, uh, Professor Ramaswamy, who some of you know very well, uh, had uh, raw data, sequencing data, both genome and uh, RNA reads. So, uh, and uh, which uh, by chance I spoke to him and uh, the collaboration began. So, Tulsi is definitely our plant of choice. And uh, the next slide I will uh, try to introduce to you uh, about a plant which actually needs no introduction in this country. Tulsi can be related to every household. Many households people keep a copy of the plant. Uh, they even do puja of it because it's considered so holy. And it's uh, holy, uh, uh, and traditionally it's not only holy, but people had realized from the first and the second century BC that it is important for uh, well being of people. To just have a plant like Tulsi in the house means you're ensuring that the atmosphere is kept clean and many diseases can be prevented. Right? So, uh, this particular text, for instance, it says Tulasi Surasa Gramya Sulabha Brahma Manjari Apetara Rakshasi Gauri Bhutakni Deva Danduvi. These are all the different names that have been given to this plant, Tulasi, in Sanskrit and shows how much people have understood uh, that it is an important plant and it's a plant, human's favorite. And I would just like to uh, bring to your attention the last line of this particular shloka which says Shukla Krishna Cha Tulasi Gunyais Tulya Prakirtita Gunyais Tulya means the properties, the guna is Tulya, it is equal. What is equal between Shukla and Krishna? Shukla is nothing but Rama Tulasi in this case and Krishna is the Krishna Tulasi. Alright, so this phrase has conveyed the beautiful secrets about not only the value of the plant of the Tulasi plant but also how they have Krishna and Rama Tulasi can be compared with each other and uh, still because of modernization, westernization, whatever, you know I don't want to give regional uh, attributes here but you know what all India went through, right? 
uh, some years ago, 100 years ago, we went through a lot of changes. And then people of different generation, especially our generation, started asking questions of the obvious. And we would ask things, how do you know that plant tulasi is really valuable, good for health, and so on. So with this in mind, I told myself, this is an opportunity, given that we are in the post-genomic era, and we can do our own sequencing and transcriptome, can we um, provide a scientific basis so that the future generation can believe uh, these medicinal plants for their value and be able to adopt them early on and prevent themselves from diseases. With this sort of a humble objective, we started looking at the plant policy and began by quantifying the extent of metabolites. Okay, the early text said that Krishna and Tulyas, uh, the both are of uh, equal guna. Uh, what, how, the, how does it look? When we put these plants in mass spectrometry, in HPLC, with all our scientific gadgets, and we find that, for instance, uh, two metabolites, one is called urosolic acid, another is called olinonic acid, and I'll come to these in a moment. You can see, as I've highlighted, the otoliferum fish, Rama tulsi, and the Krishna tulsi, they both have nearly equal amounts of urosolic acid and olinonic acid. Isn't it beautiful that whatever is inscribed in the Sanskrit text many, many years ago, thousands of years ago, could be proved right by means of our own quantific measurements. And I hope the future generation will take this as a belief, as a proof, so that uh, they will start to infuse uh, these ideas into their everyday life. Okay, so that's not everything, because uh, quantifying the metabolites is just the beginning. But like I said, we would like to do more. Uh, we would like to do genomics, transcriptomics, and so on. So this is the botanical description of this plant. Uh, it belongs to the uh, order Lamellaceae, family Lamellaceae, and the genus is Osimum. The number of chromosomes is believed to be uh, 36. It's a diploid. And uh, the, the entire DNA content of this plant is believed to be about 612 uh, MB. So with this knowledge, uh, we planned for uh, DNA and uh, RNA uh, experiments. And as I said, our colleague, uh, Professor Ramaswamy, our collaborator, had these data already. So we started to use these raw data. And during the workshop, what do these uh, terms mean will be brought into uh, better uh, detail. I don't want to go into all the details right now, except to these, say that these are raw reads. R1 and R2 refer to reads, right? And uh, we mixed uh, R1 and R2 reads and they also we got included some of raw data that comes from another genomic uh, sequencing technique called mate pair, which uh, the, in the workshop we will explain. And uh, please wait for that. Uh, it could be tomorrow, yes. And then we use all these raw reads and a lot of bioinformatics tools that we were learning as we were going along. And as soon as I had got interest on these medicinal plants, I asked my lab members who were about 20-25 of us then and I am fortunate to have uh, uh, at least two of the members here with us who are going to be uh, co-instructors in the workshop, uh, Dr. Rabbi Joshi and uh, Dr. Meenakshi Ayer who are here, uh, right here and uh, they also volunteer, in fact the whole lab volunteer and they all raised their hands and said we want to work on the genomics and transcriptomics. But the trouble is, none of us knew how these computational tools will work when we started. Okay, so we are bioinformatics labs, but our interests are on protein domain superfamilies, how they are connected, whether we can use genome databases to, you know, recognize these relationships early on. But none of us had used any of these bioinformatics tools, but we were all set to do it. So it was a very beautiful process of our learning and trying to deliver at the same time. And we used to set a lot of deadlines to ourselves, we used to have heated debates and very beautiful conversations and at first we thought we'll meet every month. And then we started meeting every week and then finally we were meeting every day almost. And we were talking about this all the time during the break, lunch break and it was a, it's been a very beautiful experience and almost for the past 10 years. And we are still learning. And in the workshop we'll tell you why we are still learning because there are so many computational tools still coming up in the using bioinformatics for genome assembly, analysis and so on. Okay. So this is one of the example flowcharts which we, in fact we had to use for sequencing utility uh, because uh, a sampling is not enough. Then we have to remove uh, repeat elements which we do 
and then we have to take evidence from transcriptome if we had and then uh, we also have to bring in uh, evidence, patterns, uh, nucleotide patterns from other plant genomes and we did all this and this is one of the flowcharts for example we have to adopt this is the computational pipeline which we use to uh, uh, recognize the genes in um, Tulsi. So getting to know the genome assembly is one thing starting from raw reads but the genes are hidden within the genome right not uh, most of the genome is not coding really for genes and again we will talk about all this in the workshop so what does our statistics tell uh, although we could um, kind of assemble nearly 374.8 MB of the nucleotides which means we have covered about 61% of the genome uh, we could use gene prediction tools as mentioned in the previous pipeline by which we uh, deciphered that there could be as many as 36,768 genes and that's not all because we also had RNA reads and that means you can assemble them do what is called as a transcriptome assembly and then we did this for Rama Tulsi and for the Krishna Tulsi so that we can compare them and those uh, values are also mentioned below in this uh, particular table. So that's uh, very interesting because that is a start that allows us to start doing an analysis and we asked simple questions about are we able to find the known genes, yes 90% of the known genes we were able to find and then are we able to find the known domains in proteins that code for particular functions and these domains are uh, many like kinase, cytochrome B450 and so on and you can see like any other decent plant genome this particular Tulsi genome that we have managed to assemble also has a large amount of kinases that showed us that we are probably doing okay because the numbers looked similar to the other plant genomes and uh, we were also fascinated to see a lot of cytochrome P450 in this particular plant because this Tulsi is a queen of herbs right so it must be engaging and using a number of enzymes to produce those beautiful secondary metabolites and what are those secondary metabolites? I come to it now, uh, for which we did a, a detailed literature survey side by side. And that means we had uh, looked into nearly 300 publications, book reviews and so on. And then uh, we listed 43 different secondary metabolites. And out of them, we could place our hand on at least 23 metabolites for which we knew back end which are all the enzymes that are responsible for producing those beautiful secondary metabolites in this plant of interest. So gathering with this knowledge, uh, we then uh, pin down to, as I said, about 12 to 13 secondary metabolites and they are shown here. You can see uh, ursolic acid which we had alluded to right in the beginning when we were comparing Rama and Krishna to Lusiriya. So that is uh, actually shown as a second entry. It is uh, known to be an anti-cancer compound. Ursolic acid is observed in small amounts in the skin of apple but it is much more abundant in Tulsi. And therefore, if your uh, forefathers had asked you to choose, choose some Tulsi leaves, it is because of these reasons, right? You know, chewing these leaves perhaps provide you the stamina so that you can prevent yourself from acquiring many diseases. And also, you have uh, things like linalunic acid, the linalunic acid. Uh, over there which is an anti-infective. So you can see how this particular queen of herbs uh, caters to a range of uh, um, cure against ailments anywhere from fever to cancer. So you can uh, use it and that is well known. But coming back to our assembled genome and looking for genes and uh, domains, uh, what we next asked is for each of these metabolites for which we knew the pathway uh, this is how the pathway might look like. We start with a precursor molecule and then an enzyme comes into the picture. It catalyzes and makes it into your product. And then another enzyme comes and it makes it into another product which then becomes the secondary metabolite of our interest, right? So we, uh, what we do is to search for these enzymes, starting from known enzymes in other plants. It could be in Arabidopsis thaliana or it could be in a closely related uh, plant. Anyway, so then we use a 